Okay, so I'll start. I'll talk about uh, this something, some new research topic which is still uh, evolving. Uh, it's called macroscopic fluctuation theory. Uh, its abbreviation is MFT, but which is not a good one because we already know we use it for mean field theory. But I will, nevertheless, I will use it sometimes. Okay, so. Uh, this is a set of techniques which was uh, developed recently in studying non-equilibrium systems. So this came while addressing this following big problem that we know when, if there is a macroscopically large system in thermodynamic equilibrium, we know how to calculate macroscopic properties of those systems. And we have this standard tool, which is the equilibrium statistical mechanics. However, contrary to that, when we look at systems outside equilibrium, we don't have such a general theoretical framework. So it's the question of how to connect the microscopic properties to that of the macroscopic properties. We know how to make that bridge in the equilibrium systems, but in non-equilibrium, we don't have such a general theoretical framework. Okay. So over the past few decades, a new direction has started. And this is mostly inspired by work in large deviation theory, in probability theory. Okay. And uh, one of the Indian who actually played a big role in developing this theory, his name is SRS Varadhan. I think many of you probably know. Okay, so this actually studies uh, in probability theory the. Uh, characterization of rare fluctuations, okay, rare events. So how does this concept comes into uh, studying non-equilibrium? It's because there is one particular function which appears in this large deviation theory. It's called large deviation function. And this is currently considered as a possible generalization of the concept of free energy to non-equilibrium systems. So that's how the connection comes. So right now, this one way of looking at non-equilibrium is to study and characterize non-equilibrium fluctuations in terms of this large deviation function, which I will explain during the course. Okay. But the, typically the problem comes is that calculation of this large deviation function is quite hard. Okay. So that's why this particular technique which was developed is called the macroscopic fluctuation theory. So it provides a systematic framework to calculate this large deviation function in a broad class of interacting particle systems outside equilibrium. And then the idea is to characterize non-equilibrium in terms of this large deviation function. Okay? So basically, this theory actually, in a brief manner, it starts at a coarse-grained description of the system. So you start at a coarse-grained so This is formerly known as fluctuating hydrodynamics. Okay. And then it essentially goes to a kind of a field theory. Which is characterized by an effective action. And then it turns out that if I look at the minimal of this action, this gives us the large deviation function of the problem of interest. So this is what roughly what um, the theory deals about. Okay. So uh, recently, so mo so this particular approach has appeared in studies of non-equilibrium system in many different forms, and many people have contributed. But the way that I will present it, mostly the credit goes to this group in Rome, uh, this Bertini, Desol, Gabrieli, Jonan, Eslio, and Landin. They have recently wrote a review article in Review of Modern Physics. So uh, I have, I'm not going to follow anything from that review article. The idea is that after this lecture, most of you could actually go back and try to read it, and hopefully you will understand it in that. Uh, another article which I would partly follow is an article by Bernard Derrida, which was also a review kind of short review article published in 2007. Some parts of it I will follow from um, this article, and many of the examples that I will talk today 
as came up uh, while discussing with him. So many of, of these things, credit goes to his uh, lectures also. Okay. So the outline that I will follow in the course is that I will first talk about equilibrium fluctuation. Very simple, what all of you know. And then I will introduce this large deviation function in equilibrium itself. And you will see that you all of you know what is this large deviation function. Then I will talk about this large deviation function in non-equilibrium systems. There I will introduce some very basic concepts, at a, which also you know, like this Langevin equation, Fokker Planck. I'll just go through very fast about it. Then I will essentially talk about macroscopic fluctuation theory in Langevin equation, which is a very simple example of just one degree of freedom. And the most of the conceptual details of the macroscopic fluctuation theory could be understood from this uh, Langevin equation. And then I will talk about the systems with many degrees of freedom, where the most of the difficulties are just algebraic difficulties, but the essential concepts of macroscopic fluctuation theory could be understood from the Langevin equations. Okay, so that's how I will go. Okay. Okay, so let me start with the equilibrium fluctuations, which many of us already know. So uh, we all know what is equilibrium. So I usually like this uh, definition of equilibrium given in Feynman's book, which I really like, which says that if a system is uh, very weakly coupled to a heat path and given at a temperature, and if the coupling has been on for a long time, and if all the fast things has happened and all the slow things not, then the system is said to be in equilibrium. The important point to note here is that there is a separation of scale. So the equilibrium is defined in a particular length and time scale. And it's very easy to understand from this picture that if you take a hot cup of coffee and keep it on the desk, so initially it's not in thermal equilibrium and you wait sufficiently long time, let's a few hours, and then it will come to a thermal uh, equilibrium with the environment. And there you can think of it like an equilibrium, but if you wait some more, then it's not in equilibrium because the coffee will just evaporate. Okay. So this is an important concept. Then the systems in equilibrium obeys the principles of thermodynamics. What do I mean by that? So I have a system which is let's say, with many degrees of freedom, and which is usually the Avogadro number of degrees of freedom. And then if I want to describe the macroscopic state of the system, then I will need few relevant macroscopic state variables, which are just very few of those. And then there are extensive variables like volume, number of particle, and total energy. Then there are intensive variables, which is like pressure, temperature, and chemical potential. And then there are thermodynamical potentials, which are like entropy, free energy, and Gibbs free energy, depending on which ensemble we are studying. Okay. And then there is statistical mechanics, which tells us how these thermodynamic potentials, one could relate to the microscopic degrees of freedom. So a simple thing is that entropy is just log of the total volume of the configuration space. And then we have the free energy, which is log of the partition function. And then there is Legenda transform to connect between this, these two. So for example, F is theta E minus S, where theta is S prime of E. Okay? So these all we know. And we also know that the averages and the fluctuations of the quantities, one could calculate in terms of this thermodynamic potential. So the very simple example, let's just take this simple example of a canonical ensemble where I have a system which is connected with the heat path with the inverse temperature beta, and then I have this energy. And I want to calculate, so the in equilibrium, the energy is fluctuating, and I want to calculate different statistical properties of this energy. So the first thing that we all know is that average of energy is simply the first derivative of the free energy. Okay? So I'm keeping the number of particle and volume fixed. We also know that if I look at the fluctuations of this energy, so this is this is the second derivative of the free energy. Now, 
what about higher moments of this energy? And actually, what about the full the probability distribution of the energy? Can one write down in terms of the same thermodynamic potential? And you all know that one could write down. So let's just write it. So, so I want to calculate the full probability distribution of the energy. So the way to simply write down is that the probability of E would be the degeneracy corresponding to the total energy E, then minus theta E divided by the partition function. Then I'm just going to write down omega e as e to the power s of e. So I have minus beta e, and z is plus f of beta. Okay. And then I'm just going to use the Legendre transform, which will give me s of e, sorry, beta e minus s of e, where? The E is F sub. Okay. Now, for, if I supply the beta, then this will give me the average energy. So let's just write down the average energy is E star. So using this, I just replace this function here. And this becomes beta E star minus S of E star. Now, if I use the extensivity, that I know that the entropy energy are extensive properties. So let's just write down as S of E as a volume type and entropy density, and E is the energy divided by the volume. So E, I'm going to write as volume times this. So then this function simply turns out e to the power v small s then e minus small s of e star minus beta e minus e star. And for standard notation, I'll just put a minus sign and make these things as So what does this say now? That if I'm now looking at the probability of E by P being small e, then I'm going to write it in this function. Okay. And this is a function which I will denote as phi of E. Okay. So this is actually called this large deviation form. And this function phi is the large deviation function. So what does it say? It says that if I'm looking at energy fluctuations in the system, which are of the order of the system size, then it is exponentially small okay, in, vo in volume. Okay? And this will be called as the large deviation form, and phi is the large deviation function. So you have to remember that here we are looking at the energy fluctuations, which are large, which are of the order of the system size. Okay, so before I discuss more about this large deviation function, I give three examples, which I leave as an exercise to be discussed in the tutorial. Yeah. Sorry? Ah, the S and... So, no, this is the probability Ah, okay. So this is so when I'm writing the small s, it's like this. I'm sorry. It's okay. So s is just the entropy. So if I have the this, I'm writing as the volume times the entropy density. This function of small d. It's okay. Okay. So I just leave three examples as a generalization of this concept. So the examples that I will give are, for simplicity, I will discuss them in one dimension. But it's very easy to generalize them to higher dimensions. So let's just take a system in one dimension. 
And this is now an isolated system, this microcanonical ensemble of length capital L. And let's look at a small window, which is small L, such that the small L is much, much larger than any correlation length in the system. And, but it's still much smaller than the total system size. Then I want to find out the energy fluctuations in this small window. And let's just say the total energy is E1. Then what I want to show in is that the result is if I take E1 divided by small l, and let's call it small E1, this will go as e to the power minus L by E1. So I should just uh, emphasize one thing here. So I will typically use this notation. What does it mean? It means that if I take log of this probability, so E by small l, E1, divided by small l, and then take limit small l going to infinity, this just goes to phi of E1. So this only means that there are, of course, the subleading correction terms, which I'm not writing. capital L. So to this, there are correlations of the microscopic fluctuations, right? So I'm taking a system size, which is much bigger than those, but it's much smaller than the total system size. Okay. Okay, so now this phi E1 would simply be exactly just this one, just to show. And here, then, the E star in that example would be, so E star is the total energy divided by system length. So this is one example. The second example is just to now think of this discretizing this into many, many similar boxes. Okay? And then I call them the energy as E1, E2, E3, and so on. So then I'm going to define a rescale coordinate, which is like x is the box number L divided by L. And I'm defining a coarse-grained energy profile now, which is E of x. Okay. Then what one could very easily show that now this would be a probability of seeing this slowly varying energy profile. This would go as minus L phi. So now this function phi is not a function, but it's a functional, which is a function of another function. Okay? And it's very easy now to write down what this function from the generalization of that. So I want you to show that phi of E of x is simply dx s of E star, which is the constant, and as s of E of x, it's just a simple generalization of that, plus theta E of x minus E star. So beta is also using the same legendary transformation. You could have shown that beta is del S of E del E, which is nothing but simply smallest prime of E. But they are at the, maxima, at, the, at the average energy value. So here I would just replace beta as S prime of E star. Okay. It, and one could show this by simply generalizing from here to go into this when you divide into many different core screen boxes. Okay. So the third example that I will show. Right. So here, so far, I looked at a system which, uh, where we are looking at the energy fluctuation, but one could also look at fluctuations of other quantities. So for example, now let's consider a system which is now coupled to a heat path and also a particle path. So this is mu is the chemical potential. And then we are going to look at similar way, but now I want to look at the number fluctuations. So the num total number of particles in a small box, let's say n1, n2, 
and so on. And similar way, when one coarse grains, so you define, let's say, ni divided by small l as simply rho of i l by l is x. Then one could find a very similar large deviation form of this density profile, which also decays exponentially with the length of the system. And then this phi has an expression, which is quite easy to derive in a very similar way. Dx. So now f is the is the Gibbs is the free energy in the canonical ensemble, the free energy density. Rho star is the average number of particles, uh, average density. Sorry. Is rho star. Where f of rho is just minus 1 over v log, sorry, so now it's not p, but this is total length, so log of the partition function at a given beta, total number of particle being rho times l and in the system length. Okay, so these are the three examples we could discuss in the tutorial, yeah. Right. So it's here I'm calc. So of course you can write down a joint large large Jewish function of joint distribution, but then this is the marginal. And when you calculate the marginal, it's only it gets dominated by the maximum or the average energy. And so at the end, that energy dependence actually goes away. And that I can also it's it would be simple to show that. So now let's go back after these examples, let's go back to the more discussions about this large deviation function in equilibrium itself. So I'll talk about a few properties of this large deviation function. This symbol, I already did, right? Just, I just did that with the log. You want me to explain one more time? This symbol, right? So this means that this symbol means if I'm taking log of the probability, see, and then I have this is the energy divided by. So here it's different. So here I'm look. It's, it's in the profile, right? So here I'm looking at the total energy e1, e2, and so on, and then each one I'm going to write as small v. So one times small l by capital L uh, times small l. And similarly for this. And then if I take log of it, divide the whole thing by capital L, then take limit l tends to infinity. This would go into minus of phi of e of x. So that symbol means that only in the last. So now we're going to, I'll tell you more about few properties of this large deviation function in equilibrium itself. And then slowly I will go to the non-equilibrium and see, show you how this concept could actually be generalized to non-equilibrium and how this could take care of many statistical properties even outside equilibrium. So the first thing is to note is that if I plot the phi function, so let me just first again write down the expression so, so that it becomes phi e. So I'm, I'm back to the original problem, which was this canonical ensemble data, and I'm looking at the energy fluctuation. So there the phi e was uh, 
S of E star minus S of E plus S prime of E star E minus E star. Okay. So just let's just So the first property is to note, if I plot the phi of E with E, this would be a complex kind of function with a minima at E star. So let's just first check. The first thing to, is to check that at E star, phi of E star is zero, okay? which trivially comes from this expression. The second is that it's a minima. is a minima, and that you can very easily check. The first thing is to see that the phi prime of E is simply minus S prime of E plus S prime of E star. Okay. Then at E star, this becomes zero. At the other thing is we need to check that what happens to the phi double prime is nothing but minus s double prime e. And this is from thermodynamics, we all know this is one over temperature square, then the specific heat per, per unit volume. So this quantity is always positive because of the stability reason. So then the phi double prime at E star is positive. So this is a minima. Okay. The third point is that one could calculate all the moments, not the, just the first and the second moments, but all the moments in terms of this large deviation function, so, which is not surprise, but there is a systematic way of calculating those, and this is called the cumulant generating function technique, which probably Sanjeev and uh, Afishak have covered. Uh, so let me just briefly go through this. So this is defined, so, so I want to calculate the, all the moments of the energy, right? So I want different moments of the total energy in this system. So the way to calculate is, one looks at a quantity which is log of the exponential lambda of E, okay? and when one expands it, one finds that this one could write it as powers of lambda, So on. And these quantities are called cumulants. Okay? And any nth cumulant of this energy is related to the nth moment in by a very simple relation. So one simply one finds that if I look at the first cumulant is just the average. Second cumulant is just the variance. There's a third cumulant, which one could also write down in a very similar. Okay, and there is a chart which one could use. Now, the point to note that one could actually calculate all these moments from the large deviation function. For that, I just look at this function now. Okay. So then I just write so that this average is simply integral d of e, e to the power lambda e, p of e, capital E. Uh, no, not c, c, sorry, c is for cumulants. So these are called cumulants. This is C. Sorry, my, my bad note. Okay. Okay, so now this is um, the average. So now I just replace these quantities. So 
in terms of small e. So this becomes lambda in L times small e. This was, has this large deviation form. So here comes L minus phi of e. Okay. Of course, there is the log. Now, for very large system size, when L is large, this integral is dominated by the saddle point. Okay. So that's part where this is maximal. So this entire quantity simply becomes the leading order. It simply becomes max. You're looking at the maximum over small e. This lambda e minus phi of e. Okay. So now this term here inside is called, is, will be denoted by g lambda, and this is called cumulant generating function. Okay. Now, by, one could make a Taylor expansion of this. So this is the total, yes, it's true that left hand side is total, but because you see, I'm looking at, I'm just want to, this kind of scale cumulant generating function. Let's, let's put it down. That would be the correct uh, statement, yes. Okay, so um, now this term one could write it in a Taylor expansion. Okay, so the left hand side in the larger limit, I had this G lambda. So there will be a Taylor expansion. This is the first derivative of lambda. That's lambda squared by two factorial, and so on. So there is, of course, there is L. By simply comparing, you could easily see that any nth cumulant is simply L times nth derivative of this cumulant generating function. So now to get any nth cumulant, one first needs to take the Legendre transform. So you see here, so the maximum, so let me just rewrite again. So using this formula, I had g of lambda is maximum e over lambda e minus phi of e. And this is the Legendre transform. So in order to calculate the moments, we just need to take the Legendre transform of the large deviation function, and then take derivatives. That would give us the, any nth order cumulant. And then from there, you could get the moments. Okay? But now, it was the fluctuation of the total energy. But one could similar, uh, very simply generalize this concept and actually talk about spatial correlations of the energy also. So I gave you that other example where the energy profile was fluctuating. And there, by simply generalizing this idea, you can actually talk about also spatial correlations, and the cumulant generating functional. Okay, so for that, let's go back to this problem again. And it's rather simple to see. Okay, so now, so let's go back to this example now. Okay, so now I have this chain, uh, this system in one dimension, and I'm looking at the energy fluctuations in different boxes. Okay, and I want to calculate now the correlations, something like e EI, EJ, EK, the fluctuations in different boxes. And let's see how one could generalize this idea for this example. And it's rather simple. So first, I told you that we defined energy at ith box divided by the box length. We define this as E of I small l by capital L is x. This simply says that if I'm looking at, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, so I of course made, yeah, I of course made a mistake. So when I'm doing a Taylor expansion, they're at lambda equal to zero. Yeah, yeah. sorry, that's my mistake. So when I'm calculating the derivative, it's lambda equal to 
So this just by the Taylor expansion. Okay. So now let's come back here. Okay. So here, by just simple scaling, you can now see that if I'm looking at any nth endpoint correlation, so let's say the first moment it would be simply small l time e of x. This is, of course, to the leading order in small l. I'm looking at two point whereas small l square, dx, dy, and so on. Okay. okay. So now we're just going to generalize this idea here, which is for the total energy fluctuation. But if I now do it for energy fluctuation in different boxes, I'd simply look at now a generating function, which would be log e to the power sum for i, lambda i, di. Okay, so similar to that. Okay. Now this, if I write down in terms of the scale variables, okay, it simply be log. Lambda, so capital L, dx, lambda x, e of x, where I just define lambda i going to lambda of x. Okay. And then from here, you could very simply as before, you can show that this is L times maximum over an energy profile. Now this is of dx, lambda x, minus phi of e of x. And this, as before, I'll call the scale cumulant generating function, functional now. Okay. Now, if you just look at uh, this derivations here, analysis, you can very easily now show again that if I'm looking at now at any endpoint correlation of this coarse grained uh, energy function, so I'm looking at EX1, EX2, and so on, XN. This is nothing but, there'd be one over L to the power N minus one. Then now a functional derivative of this quantity, delta of lambda at x1, delta lambda at xn, calculated at lambda minus one. So this correlation actually comes from uh, some kind of conservation. So if, okay, so first is, you will see right now, and uh, this is the comment I'm going to make. Okay, so let me make this comment and then we'll see. So this actually from here, we could calculate the correlation functions. So the one thing that one typically finds, oh, okay, okay. At, so the derivative at lambda equal to zero. Exn, so I'm looking at n point correlation. It goes as one over L to the power n minus one and nth functional derivative, delta of lambda at x1 with this to xn and calculated at lambda equal to zero. Okay. Okay. So let's come back to this question by Sanjeev. So what does it tell us about correlations in, uh, uh, in the equilibrium systems? So one typically finds, so as I told you, that the large deviation function in equilibrium is a local function. What do I mean by that? So see, when I wrote down E of x, the formula that I gave you, there was only a one space integral, and then there was some function. This is a local function. So if I take a 
derivative of this. So if I take a local function here, phi, and then take a legenda transform, which will give me this g of x, g of lambda x. So for a local function, the g of lambda x is also a local function. If I then take a derivative of this g, then I will only get delta functions. So that will tell me that the correlations are all short range. But this is something unusual which happens in non-equilibrium. What one typically finds that the large deviation function for a non-equilibrium system actually becomes non-local functions. What means there that there are say, multiple integrals inside. So if you take derivatives of a non-equilibrium system's large deviation function, then one typically finds that the correlations becomes long range. So in non-equilibrium systems, one usually finds that the correlations are long range at a generic parameter value. Yeah. Right. Right. So in the non-equilibrium, which will actually come in the later part of the uh, course, but uh, roughly what it means is that there is a fast degrees of freedom and the slow degrees of freedom. The fluctuation that comes in, they are in the correlations that I will talk about correlations of a current, where the fluctuations would come due to this fast degrees of freedom. And those fluctuations are uncorrelated. But then due to conservations and others, when I evolve over time, it develops long-range correlation in the coarse grain variables. Yeah, indeed, exactly. And that's what one finds that when I look at the fluctuations of these coarse grain variables profiles, or the there there is the functional is non-local, and one finds long-range correlation. Okay. okay. Okay, so now let's uh, come back to non-equilibrium. So I'm now going to talk about mostly non-equilibrium and see how one could generalize this concept of this large deviation function for non-equilibrium systems. And there we would like to calculate all the, characterize all the non-equilibrium fluctuations in terms of this concept, which is large deviation function, and where one could actually generalize it. Okay. So let's, for that, just for the sake of students, let's we give, uh, few examples of non-equilibrium, what people usually studies. So uh, one could think of non-equilibrium processes are those also which are still haven't reached equilibrium, and you're still approaching, and those are also non-equilibrium processes. So for very simple examples that you could think, it's just you take a box of gas with a piston, and then you just move the piston and let wait how the system reaches the equilibrium state. And so that's a non-equilibrium process. One could think of quenching, so for example, you start a system, let's say, Ising model, at a temperature much higher so that you're in the disordered phase, and you suddenly decrease the temperature and to a below that critical temperature and let the system now equilibrate. So that's a non-equilibrium process. So this is one example. These examples are like systems which are approaching equilibrium states. Then there, there are examples where the system will never reach an equilibrium state, and these are, they actually reach a non-equilibrium stationary state. So for example, you take a heat conducting rod and now couple with two different temperature reservoirs. Okay. So what would happen that initially the system will have some kind of temperature profile which is evolving, and at a large time it will set in a uniform, it's a non, it's, it's, it will set in a temperature profile which will not change in time, and it, that means it reaches stationary state. So this is a non-equilibrium stationary state. There are also other examples. So this is an example where the non-equilibrium comes due to the boundary effect. You could have examples where the system is driven in, a, in the bulk, and that leads to non-equilibrium. So for example, if you take a system on a uh, periodic um, uh, ring, and then you have charged particles, and put them under an electric field here, or a magnetic field, so that they keeps getting driven. And this would be a non-equilibrium example, because there is a non-zero current which is flowing around. Then there are other examples which Sriram would probably talk. These are the examples of active matters, which are the self-propelled particle that each particle has its own engine. If you just put them in a box, so these systems has their own engine, and then you ask at a long time if there is a stationary state, what are the properties of the this collective properties of these systems? So these are typical examples of non-equilibrium systems. Okay. So so far the question now is how one could generalize these kind of concepts of large deviation to the non-equilibrium systems. 
So typically, it's just a background. So typically, the, so far, the studies of non-equilibrium are roughly people considered in three different ways. So one is an approach to non-equilibrium, where one studies more structural properties of the systems, like try to prove more general statements, like fluctuation theorems, or uh, uh, something which is called stochastic thermodynamics, so which I will not go into that direction. There is other approach to non-equilibrium, which are more of exact solutions. So people studies kind of cook up simple models in out of equilibrium systems and then try to derive exact results. So there are famous models like symmetric exclusion process, asymmetric exclusion process, cox cone lebowitz models, and one could, you can look at the many non-equilibrium literatures, so where they try to derive all these statistical properties in terms of exact calculations. And the third is this hydrodynamic approach. So this large deviation and macroscopic fluctuation theory comes in this third approach, which is rather a mesoscopic description, which neither tries to derive the microscopic exact solution, but rather in a macroscopic coarse plane scale. So that's where this lectures and the informations that I will tell you would be in this third approach to non-equilibrium. Okay, so how does one now generalize this concept of large deviation to non-equilibrium? So there's a very simple example, which you could see how it generalizes. Let's take this example of a heat conducting rod coupled with two temperature reservoirs. So when the two temperatures are at equal value, so if the T1 and T2 are the same, then as I told you, one could ask the energy fluctuations here, and one could calculate that there is, there will be an energy profile fluctuation can be written in a large deviation form, which would be like L phi of E. Okay. And then we know how to derive the phi from the equilibrium properties. Now, if I make these two temperatures different, then the system will reach a non-equilibrium stationary state. And when, what one finds that this form still holds, but this function is now different, and there are actually no systematic way now to calculate this function because there is no equilibrium statistical mechanism. So the challenge is now is to calculate these functions, these large deviation functions, and then as you see that as long as one could write down the energy fluctuations in this form, then in a very similar way you can calculate many statistical properties like correlations and other quantities in terms of this large deviation function even outside equilibrium. Okay. Okay, so there is, for large deviation, there is a very well-known review, uh, which um, is quite instructive to go through this. So let me give this review article. So it's a review article written by Hugo Tuchet in 2009. It's in Physics Reports. page 1 to 69. Okay, so this is an introductory level uh, review article on large deviation function. Okay, so uh, now let me give a rather formal introduction to the large deviation function in terms of a simple example, which is almost like a typical example everyone uses. So this is the example of random walker. Let's just talk about now large deviation function in this simple example. So we are just talking about the standard, this Rife level uh, random walker on a discrete line on a discrete time step where the particle is jumping on either side with equal probability, so half and half. Okay. So here, x of t, so that if every time the particle makes a jump to the right, I take uh, it increase by one, if to the left, it decrease by one, so let's just write down then this variable, the f from one, f from two, f from t, which takes value plus or minus one. Now, so we know that if I take x t by t, then t very large, so this would converge to zero, so this would give me my average position. Then there is central limit theorem, which tells me that if I'm looking at the variance of it, this is simply is proportional to time. 
total number of steps that it took. So that means that typical displacement that one sees is of the order of square root of t. And then the center limit theorem tells me that if I'm looking at probability distribution, which are of the order of this typical displacement, so let's just call small x, this is simply Gaussian. But what if I want to look at fluctuations which are beyond this typical displacement, which where that's where the, this means a large fluctuation, rather rare events, and how does that probability looks like? Okay. So this one finds that this, if I now scale with let's say total uh, displacements of the order of the total time steps, then there is a large deviation form, which goes as minus pi of r. Now this I leave as an exercise, it's very simple to show this. Okay. Uh, so what one, the result is that phi r is one plus r divided by two log of one plus r plus one minus r by two log of one minus r. And this one could very easily show starting from the well-known binomial uh, distribution of the random order. And so this uh, you should try in the tutorial. Okay, so then there are other examples. So here, this is an example of one walker. You could have think of is it, uh, the statistics when there are multiple walkers, and the walkers are such that they cannot cross each other. So these are well-known examples which are known as single file. So the idea is that now you have many, many such walkers, and that they cannot cross each other. And then you want to look at the probability distribution of one particle. So it turns out that there, the typical displacement, if you look at, so it's t square, this now goes as square root of t. And then if you want to look at the rare fluctuations, which is atypical displacement, one has a large deviation form. So here I want to now, so it will, typical displacements are of the, sorry, this I, so this is square root of t, that means the typical displacements are of the order of t to the power one quarter. Okay. So the atypical displacement, if I want to look, would be, let's say, order of square root of t. So this, this, this has a large deviation form. So the rules are that now you have Walker, okay, but if it finds, so it's the SEP, SEP is one example. So it cannot crawl, hop over the other part. It jumps to the nearest neighbor. No, they, you start with a random distribution of them. And then you look at one particle and look at its statistics. One particle. So you just fix the particle, color it, and then look at its position. Stack particle. Okay, so this is another example. So let's, so this is the second example. So the third example, so, so far I told you one example which is about this temperature fluctuation there when you couple with two different temperature reservoirs. But you can also look at the net energy flow, or let's say the current. Okay. Let's say the current, so I'm looking at the total flow up to certain time, capital T. Okay. So it turns out that in this system, there is also a large deviation form. So if you just write, P, so QT, divided by T, let's call it small j. So this is mostly for diffusive system. Of course, in one dimension, there are anomalous transport. So there is large deviation form. This example? Yes. No, no. So these are, so phi is actually, so sorry, this, I should clarify, the phi is now depend on example to example. So for example, in this case, the calculation of phi is quite difficult. Actually, Sanjeev and Abhishek has written their article about how to calculate this phi function. Okay, so the, so this one point which I want you to Notice here that every time when I'm defining this large deviation function, as if I'm this value here which I'm scaling, and the power here, for example, the t and t, they are the same. But this is not necessarily the case. So they, for example, 
So let me give one example where you have to scale the, your quantity by different variable and you get a different power in the exponential. So if this is an example where you, let's say, take particles hopping on a lattice. So there are many, many particles. And with the rules that they just jump from one to the other with uh, equal probability as long as the next site is empty. Okay? So this is a famous example known as SEP, symmetric exclusion process. So here, if I now look at the statistics of activity. So activity means up to time t, I count how many times the particle has jumped. Okay? So total number of particle jumps. Okay? So this is the how much active the system is. So there, one finds this following light distribution form. So let's call A at T is the activity up to time T. And this, okay, this has a scaling form. You see that the two scalings are different. Okay. So these are the examples of large deviation functions in many uh, uh, simple systems. Okay. So now let's just make, let me make a few comments about the large deviation function outside equilibrium. Large deviation function. So the typical example we'll keep in mind is this one. So happening with T1, T2, and I'm looking at this is the energy profile. Okay, so it turns out that so as in the equilibrium case, the phi function here is also has a typically has a minima uh, with a minima at the most probable profile. Okay? And all moments and the correlations could be calculated even in this non-equilibrium system. The second is that one typically finds in non-equilibrium that phi function is non-local. And that leads to long-range correlation. First point is that phi function has uh, this convex structure with a minima at the most probable profile. Okay. Then the second is the phi. No, it's also for the profile. So this one, I, in general, so if I'm looking at the current, so it would be where you can easily put, uh, like draw it. But if you look at now a profile, it would be in a higher dimension. But this fact that there is large deviation function is minima at the maximum value of the profile would still remain true. Okay? So the third is that sometimes this large deviation function could be related to the, the non-analyticity property of large deviation could be related to the phase transitions. Okay? Just like in the case of equilibrium. So let me give one example without getting into details of non-equilibrium phase transition where one indeed finds that there is non-analytic property near a phase transition. So this is an example, which is, again, particle on a lattice. So this is known as TASIP. So here, what each particle is doing is that it jumps only to the right neighbor, okay? and only if the, next, the place where it's going is empty. Okay? And then just couple with two particle reservoirs, so rho A, rho B. And then this system is known to exhibit a non-equilibrium phase transition with a rich phase diagram. Let me just draw the phase track. Rho B and rho A. The phase diagram is, sorry, the order parameter you may think of is what is the average density in the bulk? Okay. So it turns out that in this part, the average density 
is rho b, dominated by the right reservoir. Here is the dominated by the left reservoir. And here is the density is constant. Then one finds that there is second order transition in this line, this line. And then there is a coexistence phase here. So here what happens is that there are shock profiles. It turns out that along the line, there is a shock phase. So density on the left is rho a, density on the right is rho. And now, if one, for, so for this system, one has calculated, actually, Bernard Derrida, Joel Lebowitz, and Jean Spear have calculated the exact large deviation function of the density profile for these systems. Okay. And it turns out that this, in this system, one finds the non analytic behavior. So, for example, if one looks at large deviation function of let's say, the average bulk density, one finds that it has a flat profile like this. Just like in coexistence phase in equilibrium. There are also other examples where one could look at uh, something called. So, if you look at a system, so it's a little generalization of this model. So, rather than here making only jumps to the right, if you think about jump also to the left, so let's say it makes a jump on the left with rate one, and then on the right, I make it slightly more jump. So, I make it. Right is one plus, so let me just write it with the one. So I make it slightly biased. Okay. So now in this system, if I'm looking at the large deviation function of current, which, which I told you that if I look at the total current divided by T and J, so the probability of this, going as e to the power minus T phi of J. Okay. It turns out that for very small values of nu, this bias parameter, if you write down the phi of j, okay, it has a nice property. But as one slowly increases the new, it turns out that at some point, this large division function becomes non-analytic at this point. So there is a phase transition as one increases this bias parameter. New. So this is just to make the point that non-equilibrium phase transitions have a signature in terms of large division function reflected as non-analyticity. Right, so as I answer to Sriram's question, that this when we're describing in terms of a coarse grain field. So when I'm coarse graining, I'm coarse graining over the fast degrees of freedom. So I said there's a concept of local equilibrium I can think of. So I'm going a scale which is beyond so where I could think about a local equilibrium. Then I'm talking about fluctuations of these slow modes. And then all this long range correlation in terms of this coarse grain field. Right, the gap, I mean the gap lace phases. Okay. So, not that I know of at this moment. Uh, so, definitely one could study those things. But not. Okay, so the last property just I wanted to say that this large division function uh, also has some symmetry properties, which are sometimes quite important. So, for example, let's talk about this one that I mentioned. So, it's a system again, with coupled with now, let's say, not the particle system, but coupled with two temperatures, T1 and T2. Okay. And I'm looking at the large deviation function of current. It turns out that for diffusive systems, there is a symmetry of this large deviation function, which is simply that phi of minus j minus phi of j, j times 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1. Okay. So this just roughly says that if I want to look at a fluctuation, a current which is of in the negative current and compared to the positive current, this the ratio, the, this exponentially small. So j times 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1. So if t1 equal to t2, both signs of current are equally probable. But if they are not, then the negative current is exponentially rare to find. Okay? So this is a symmetry in outside equilibrium. So these kind of properties of large deviation function, their symmetry properties, connection to uh, phase transitions, makes them very important uh, quantity to study in non-equilibrium. 
And then all these discussions of MF microscopic fluctuation theory would go into analyzing and calculating this large deviation function in a large class of non-equilibrium systems. Okay? So now let me just start with a few basics of non-equilibrium, which will be important to understand a few things in the course. So these would be very basic stuff in non-equilibrium, like master equation, Langevin equation, and Fokker Planck. I assuming that most of you know what these are, so I'll just make a few comments uh, just so that I just set a notation. So I'm just now considering a system with, config, with many configurations. So this is one, C2, C2. Okay, so these are the configurations of the system, and the system makes jump from one to the other with certain probabilities. Okay. Then one write down this uh, Markov property. So if I want to write down the probability of the system to be at state, let's say, k, okay, at a certain time, tk, then this is simply sum over all k minus 1 and all times one, and the probability to be at CK one. So this is the conditional probability that I'm at configuration CK1, CK minus, CK minus 1, CK minus 2, and so on in the history. And given that, I'm at configuration CK. And then it's the probability to be found in these earlier configurations. So then if I just sum over all these earlier configurations, that should give me my configuration at time t. Okay. Now the Markov property says that this conditional probability doesn't only depend on what where it was in the previous step. So this is just a function. Okay. Then to go to the master equation, one what one does, so let's say that it made a jump in a time small time window dt. So this, if I write, this will simply be ck k minus one plus dt. and so on. So I'm just expanding. So you see that at if the dt is 0, then the particle has to be in the same configuration. So this now defines my transition rate. And then one could simply from here, one could write down the master equation. Okay. The master equation will be. So this master equation defines or gives the time evolution of the probability so at any configuration C. This is time T. So this all of you know. Okay, the other quantum property that comes that because the total probability has to sum up to one one has to show that this, the rate to go from same to the same configuration has to be minus of okay. So one could write down formally this master equation as dt, t, dt, c as for a matrix. Where M, so this is the evolution matrix. This simply is C time to C for C not equal to C time. And this is simply sum over
So it's a matrix whose only the diagonal, so its column sums are zero. So the diagonal elements are just the sum over all the rest of the entries in the column. Okay. There's another one way of writing this same equation. Simply just a re rewriting the form. This, yeah, sorry. No, not yet. So this is equal to dp dt. Okay, this is. So there is a reason why I'm repeating all these things. Uh, it because I just want to set the notation. The first thing that one sees. So in the stationary state, we know that this has to be zero because the probability is not evolving. So then the question comes: How do I make this zero? So if it turns out that if this term inside is zero, then it satisfies something called detail balance, and then it leads to equilibrium, right? So it says that the current, the probability current across every bond is zero. Okay? So the equilibrium is associated to net the zero current on the configuration space. And then this, this detail balance. So this, I will use it very soon uh, to derive something important. This okay. So this, if this happens, then it's, uh, it ensures equilibrium. Now there is one interesting property which I think is good to know. So often when it's taught in uh, lectures, so if you see to check what if the system satisfies detail balance or not, you need to know what is the stationary probability distribution. But is there a way to know that, given the rates, whether without knowing the stationary distribution, can you tell that this would satisfy detail balance or not? And then there is a simple criteria, which is called Kolmogorov criteria. Which actually tells, by, if you just simply look at the rate, then it ensures you could tell whether the system will reach equilibrium or not. And the, the criteria is the following. So the idea is that on the configuration space, you just look at any closed loops. Okay? And then if you look at, let's say, first count in the clockwise direction and take products of all the jump rates. Okay? So first jump rate to go from C1 to C2, then C2 to C3, and C3 to C1. Okay? So if that product is exactly equal to the product of rates to go in the reverse direction, the anti-clockwise, then this is a necessary and sufficient condition which ensures that there is equilibrium. Okay? So it's something is good to know. Uh, okay, so the other thing is that so as soon as the detail balance is broken, then the system becomes non-equilibrium. And then in the stationary state, the, the stationary state for a rate uh, which doesn't satisfy detail balance will be the non-equilibrium stationary state. Okay, now I'm going to use this detail balance condition to to show an important property for systems in equilibrium. And that property will be used uh, in studying macroscopic fluctuation theory at some point. And that is uh, the property which was due to Onsager. Uh, it says that if for a system in equilibrium, there is a time reversal symmetry. So what does it mean? It means that if, I were, if in an equilibrium state, I see a particular trajectory or history of the system, then the probability to see the time reverse trajectory is the same. Okay. So let me just show that. It's very simple to see. Okay. So for that, let me first define what do I mean by the trajectory. Okay. So let's just look for a time. And here, I just plot the configurations. So what happens that at time zero, it's let's just start at C1. And then at time T1, it makes a jump to another configuration, which is let's say C2. Then again at time, sometime T2, it makes a jump to another configuration, C3, and so on. And then it goes on until let's say I wait until the final time 
let's see if you just see. Okay, so this would be my configuration, uh, the trajectory. Okay, so what is the probability of this trajectory? So this C1, C2, this one. Okay, so for that, I have to find out what are the probabilities for these events to happen. So if I'm looking at the probability to go from C1 to C2, that's given by my uh, transition rates, which is, so in a small time, see, this would make a jump from C1 to C2. Okay. And what is the probability that the system remains at C1 up to time T1? That would be very simple. So the probability to remain at let's say c1 or up to t1 you can simply find it by this expression so let me i will explain this so here there would be So it just says I discretize the time into small windows dt. Then for a time dt, what's the probability that it remains? So I just have to sum over all possible transition rates that it would go from C1 to any other configurations C prime. Okay. And then yeah. Here. So here these are configurations. So I'm just writing, so it's think of as like discrete points. Each one. So the measure is not important here. Uh, so it, for here it doesn't matter. It's just to denote in a picture that you are moving from one configuration to the other. It doesn't. They don't see even here. It could come back to the same one. Okay. So it's just a notation, just to describe what could happen. Typically. Okay. So now, so the probability to remain in that configurations would be. Just the one minus the probability for it to go out, total probability to go out. So then if I take dt to zero limit, this I will get simply minus t sum over c prime w c prime. Okay. So this, as I, in the, my previous notation, this was this matrix c1. Uh, with the sorry, so there this it was a minus. So, so this becomes e to the power t m c one. Okay. So now let's write down what is the probability of a trajectory. Okay. So it would be very simple to just write down. So just write down the product of all the properties of all those events that has happened in during that trajectory. So now I look at the probability of so this I would call as a forward trajectory now. So as I'm starting with C1, I'm going for positive in the time direction. And let's say a typical trajectory would simply be now that you start at so one starts at C1. Then you remain up to time T1 at a configuration C1. So that would simply be T M C1 C1. Right? Then one makes a jump. So that is go to C2 from C1. Okay. And then of course there is DT. And then so on. Okay. Up to time. Final time minus Tn, M, Cn, Cn. So last one, let's call it Cn. Okay. So this is the probability of a trajectory. Now let's think about the time reverse trajectory. So time reverse trajectory means that I'm looking at now a trajectory which starts at Cn, and then goes backward. Then it's also simple to write. So let's just write down the time reverse. 
into a stratigraphic field. So now it will start at P of Cn. Then it has to remain, so let's say it made a jump at Tn, at capital T minus Tn time to at Cn, which would be capital T minus Tn, M, Cn, Cn, and so on. Okay. Then what I want to show that the probability of the two trajectories is simply one. So if you just do the calculation, you see that all these exponential terms, they would just cancel because it was exactly the same amount of time it remained in both sides of the trajectories. Okay. The only difference that will come that in the forward trajectory, let's say it went from Cn minus 1 to Cn, or in the reverse trajectory, it would be from Cn to Cn minus 1. Okay. So it would be this ratio be the product of all those, so let's just start, so start from here, so C2, C1, it started at probability C1, and then, then it just goes on, C3, C2, and Cn, Cn minus 1, and the time reverse case it would be P of Cn, then goes to n minus 1 cn, and so on, to c1 cn. Okay. Then what I want you to check is simply using the detail balance condition, which I wrote before, see that all these terms would cancel. Okay. So this would give you 1. So this is an important result which will be used later on which says that if I want to see a prob if a system is in equilibrium and I want to see a particular history, the probability of seeing that history is the same as the probability also to see a time reverse trajectory. Okay. So this, you will see that will be quite useful to solve certain problems of this interacting particle systems in equilibrium, and one could sometimes make the solutions quite easy by simply considering this criteria. Okay, okay so the next, uh, lecture, I will very quickly go through the Langevin equations and briefly the Fokker-Planck equation. Then what I will do is to talk about the large deviation functions, how to calculate large deviation in the Langevin equations, and then I'll talk about all these action formulations, the Hamiltonian picture, the Hamilton-Jacobi equations, while one calculates large deviation func function for this Langevin equation. And then later on, I'll go to multiparticle systems. So there it depends on which system, if it's a bulk driven, then it's 1 over R to the D minus 2, and if it is, sorry, it's 1 over R to the D, if it's a boundary driven, then 1. No, so, so interacting particles, so, so far the description that I will tell you is so far cannot handle those bulk driven systems or it can handle the weakly uh, driven systems in the bulk. So the models like TASEP or asymmetric exclusion process, this formalism so far cannot handle yet. So that's the big problem still now to go there. But for the case of boundary driven case, uh, which I will show you, that one could actually calculate all the correlations and in fact even get this power law behaviors for any general diffusive system and you could map it to electrostatic problem, and you could really show that for any general diffusive system, there is a power law behavior. Ah, so, just starting with the standard fluctuating hydrodynamic? Okay. So, without going to the action formalism. Yes, so, there is of course a way of doing it, but you will realize that very soon, it would get out of, I mean, if you want to calculate, it's not controlled in the sense that when you try to do the calculation, it is too complicated so if you want to calculate end point code. So two point correlation you could very easily do. So uh, I we can tell you, so it's in fluctuating hydrodynamics you expand around the noise strength, right? So if I want to look at the two point correlation, I have to look at only linear order in noise strength. If I want to go for the three point, I have to look at epsilon square order. And there is a systematic way you can actually calculate not just equal time correlations, also multi-time correlations in any general different diffusive system, starting from just fluctuating hydrodynamics. 
but it gets really difficult once. So using this action formalism, you, I will at some point discuss that this calcul analysis becomes quite simple and you could get it in just in one page, you could get those results, I mean, at least the formal results.